Why are politicians looked down upon in, the, in our society? Well, Paul, it hasn't always been that way. As you know, in the early days of the Republic, uh, politics was the great profession. I think this was true perhaps through uh, the Civil War up until the time of the uh, great uh, expansion of business in the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, then I think the, the muckraking of many of the editorial writers mm -hmm. and the historians, which began in the early part of the 20th century, uh, began to destroy all of the, of the pictures that we had of our heroes of our early days. Uh, they told the real story of Washington and the real story of Lincoln and all the weaknesses of Grant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the fact that politics was a pretty venal uh, profession began to come out. Uh, of course, you can pick any profession and find venality in it. Uh, business, the law, uh, perhaps even yours. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, in the field of politics, it is, it is true that in this country, uh, as particularly in the last 25 years, uh, as a result of cartoons, as a result of television commentary, as a result of newspaper stories and books, uh, that politicians generally are not considered to be a particularly admirable group of people. Generally speaking, uh, the young people of a nation are idealistic. Uh, they don't like to think in terms of compromise. Uh, that's why you will find them uh, protesting for good causes. They'll join a march for anything. They'll march for peace or they'll march against it. Uh, they'll march for civil rights or so forth and so on. And the reason is that they see the great issues in the world in black or white. Uh, as you get older, uh, you find that if you take that kind of an attitude about great problems, that you produce no progress. Uh, you go off uh, uh, on one extreme or another. And the result is the two extremes fight each other and the great center, which is the mainstream of uh, American political life, uh, doesn't uh, come through. So the political man must be one who can look at the idealism on the right and the left and then find, uh, if I may use the term, the consensus in the center, uh, which will produce progress. Now, when a political man does that, however, uh, this loses him support on the right, on the extreme right, and it loses him support on the extreme left. Uh, it loses him the support of the idealist. And they talk about the politician as being a practical, compromising, scheming uh, man. Uh, in the years I was in Washington, and in the years since I've left there, been a, and have been observing senators and congressmen, most of them are far more idealistic than you would imagine. Uh, most of them would recoil at the idea of trading their vote, in effect, on a major bill for something that they wanted in their district. Uh, I would say, uh, however, that looking at the president or the majority leader or whoever has the responsibility for getting a major through, he must think in terms of the great objective at the end. I don't, I don't mean that he should go so far as the totalitarians do, any means to an end. Uh, that, of course, means that in the end, uh, you destroy the very system that you are attempting to build. But I do mean uh, that if there is a great objective to be achieved, it is necessary for uh, the leader to find ways to get the necessary votes to put that across. Uh, and if it becomes necessary at times to talk a congressman or a senator into supporting a measure because that congressman or senator uh, has a project in his district which he thinks is very important to the people of his district, then I think it might be necessary to do what Lyndon Johnson has done from time to time, and other presidents, Republican and Democrat, before him. Well, wouldn't it be better to admit it once in a while than to always deny it now? The difficulty with that, by admitting it, you would, <laughs> you would destroy the man, the man who, received, who, who happened to give the vote. Uh, let's look at your congressman or senator, and uh, let's suppose he had traditionally voted against foreign aid. Uh, and let's suppose that as a result of getting a post office in the biggest city in his town, uh, rather than having that post office being built in the district next door, he voted for foreign aid. Uh, he'd never win another election because our people are still idealistic. Uh, this is to their great credit. Uh, we're, uh, I think you could put it this way, we're hopelessly idealistic. It's the great thrust in America. It's the basis for our foreign policy and the basis for our policy at home. And uh, for, consequently, the political man uh, would have great difficulty in uh, projecting uh, 
any kind of leadership image if he were to go out to the people and say, well, I had to do this in order to get the vote of Congressman X on this particular measure. Uh, to what extent do you agree with the proposition that a, a man's first duty is to get reelected on the ground, that if he, if he doesn't hold office, he won't be able to do anything for any cause? Let's suppose now that you are a congressman from a particular district. Uh, let's suppose that uh, your party is in the majority, uh, but the majority is very, very thin. Uh, let us suppose that uh, you have a stiff, stiff contest uh, against you by somebody who's trying to get your seat in the Congress. Uh, and your winning that seat may make the difference between your party keeping the majority or losing it. Uh, then I think what the man does is perhaps to rationalize. Uh, I don't think any man would wants to say, well, uh, getting myself reelected for my own selfish purposes is mm -hmm. the main object mm -hmm. of life. But I think when a man puts it in a broader perspective and says, I must get myself reelected because thereby I can serve my party and my party can do a better job serving this country than the other party, you see how easy it is to yeah. reach the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Nixon, do you think that as a general rule, and there are, must be exceptions to any rule, that politics in its upper reaches should be a rather exclusive profession? Do you think that people aspiring to very high office should have come up through governor's chairs or city councils or state legislatures or years in the Congress? Or do you think people can come in from widely disparate professions in, the, in their late 40s and early 50s and, and run for high office with no previous training in politics? Do you, do you, do you, is there any rule of thumb on this in your view? No rule of thumb. As a matter of fact, uh, the rule now certainly is being changed as a result of the exceptions. Uh, you, you look, for example, at uh, men like uh, Governor Romney. Uh, he comes from the world of business and uh, skyrockets up as the governor of Michigan. That was his first elective office. Uh, you look, for example, at Governor Reagan. Governor Reagan came from uh, the world of acting, and he moved up to the first ranks in American political leaders as a result of winning a sensational victory in California. Uh, I think that in, in the years ahead, educators, uh, certainly uh, businessmen, lawyers, others who have been immensely successful in their professions are very likely to move directly into politics, move across horizontally rather than to come up vertically. Now, when you say, you is, this, is this the best thing? Do I approve of it? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's uh, bad for the country to have uh, two Republican governors, Governor Romney or Governor Reagan, move directly into top office without coming up through the chairs. No, I think that in our system, it's probably good to have the yeast of change. change. Uh, the, uh, uh, not, uh, there's, a tendency, there's a tendency when you have simply organization politics uh, for the men to become basically prisoners of the organization. They become dull. They become unexciting. They become unimaginative. There isn't enough improvisation. Uh, now, when the new man comes in from the outside, he'll make a lot of mistakes. He'll break a lot of China. Yeah. But on the other hand, some things will happen. Things will start yeah. turning. Uh, and uh, so therefore, this, this idea that only a man who first run, who wants to go up, he's first got to be a precinct captain, and then he must be an assemblyman, and this, and he must be a congressman, and then he must be a senator. And then if he isn't too old, maybe he can run for president. That isn't the way it's going to work, and I don't think the way it should work. As a citizen, are you afraid of the power of the presidency? I don't mean as a person who may seek it, but uh, as a citizen, do you feel there's too much power concentrated in that office? That the president has, <clears throat> with a big defense budget, for instance, can influence it pol politically? Does this bother you? Yes, the, the power of the presidency in terms of the spending does bother me. Uh, and the more that that power can be contained by a strong, responsible Congress, the better for the country. On the other hand, I would suggest that the power of the presidency in terms of the conduct of foreign policy does not Indeed. bother me. Uh, I would rather that we lived in a world that was all neat and packaged, uh, where when the United States becomes involved in military struggles, you could have a formal debate in the Congress and then have a declaration of war. There'll never, no, there'll never be another declaration of war, in my opinion. That time really? is gone, and uh, we're... Rightly? Not, it'll, what's that? Rightly? That time is rightly gone? Well, whether it's rightly or wrongly, because of the development of nuclear weapons, it is gone. Because of what happened uh, in terms of the Korean War, where, which I think was the last conventional war in which major powers were involved. Because we stopped uh, a conventional kind of uh, aggression there, 
I do not believe there will be any conventional war in which the United States will be involved in the future. Then you don't I think agree. It's going to, I think it's going to be the kind of a war, if it comes, where the major powers are involved, which will be nuclear in character or guerrilla in character. Now, when we talk about the powers of the presidency, I do not want to restrict a president, either a Republican or a Democratic president, so much that he cannot act quickly if quick action is required. In your experience over the years, which has been right in most fights between the executive and the legislative branches? Who has been right, the president or the Congress? Uh, I think that generally speaking, the Congress is not too effective when it comes to making foreign policy. Not that it, Congress shouldn't be listened to. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, however, in domestic fields, uh, more often the Congress is representative of what the people at home really want. Uh, let's, take, let's take spending. Uh, we hear all of this argument about whether we should spend more or spend less. Uh, and the Congress is always accused of trying to uh, gut this bill or crippling amendments. You know all the ones, that, mm -hmm. the terms that are used by the editorial writers. Uh, generally speaking, however, this kind of restraint on a president is a very healthy thing. Because otherwise, an administration tends to run away on the spending tack. Run away because this brings more and more power. It is this kind of power, the power of the purse, that the Congress should constantly restrain, in my opinion. What about the power in our society of the business community or, and or uh, what General Eisenhower mentioned in his farewell address, the military-industrial complex? Do you worry about either, either of these as sources of excessive power? Yes, I do. Uh, there isn't any question but that when a business concern, for example, uh, has an interest in a government contract, uh, that that business concern is going to be affected by that interest uh, and will use its pressure uh, on the congressman or senator from that particular state or district uh, to uh, see that appropriations are made in the interest of that particular concern. Uh, let's take the space program. Now, we all know that the space pr program has a great deal of public appeal the excitement of going to the moon, the excitement of keeping ahead of the Russians, or at least catching up with them when they happen to be ahead. And so therefore, the space program has been able to get just about what it needed, or, what it, uh, or even more than it needed. And yet, uh, there are simply a lot of business concerns across this country that has so a vested interest in the space program that it's very likely that some of those appropriations are excessive. Mm -hmm. I believe that uh, in this instance, it's vitally essential for the president where there are lobbying groups like this, uh, which, whether they're the vested interests of labor or business, uh, to be the balance wheel. Uh, I think in some cases the Congress can be. But more often than not, you will find that the Congress reflects uh, the views of either of, of the special vested interests within uh, their particular districts or states. Now that isn't bad and that isn't wrong because a Congress is supposed to reflect the people. Uh, and they're supposed to fight for them. And I admire a congressman from Florida, or Cape Canaveral, who's up there fighting for more appropriations for space. I admire a congressman from California, and I respect him, who fights for more uh, contracts for aerospace in California. That's his job. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that it's j simply selfishly motivated. But I am saying that the national interest requires that we have, at the highest level, uh, men who can look beyond these special vested interests and see to it that no military industrial complex or no labor industrial con uh, complex uh, results in the adoption of policies that are not in the broad general interest. What about another source of power in our society which is usually immune from criticism, the news media? You hmm. criticized this once uh, in a yeah. moment of uh, some heat. Uh, uh, after all these years, how do you feel about the news media? Do you think we have too much power and that we wield it badly? I think the news media, the power of the news media, is such that uh, it can only be controlled by the news media themselves. Uh, because here, we really do have a sacred cow. Uh, it's a sacred cow because we must recognize that uh, any suggestion that, for example, a television program is unfair or that a column is unfair or that a news report is inaccurate is always seized upon by the, the news media themselves as being an attack on freedom of the press. Uh, I don't care what newspaper it is and I don't care what uh, uh, television station it may be. Uh, I know how they deeply resent it. Now, I followed a rather interesting personal 
uh, role in that respect. You may remember during the campaign of 60, uh, my, her my press secretary, Herb Klein, thought that at times uh, we were getting uh, the shaft from some of the reporters, as I'm sure uh, Pierre Salinger thought that Kennedy was from some of the reporters. I don't we followed an exactly different line there, however. Never during the course of that campaign, never during the time in wa uh, that I was in Washington, did I ever complain about a reporter, either to his superior uh, or to a publisher. And it was because I, I really felt that uh, there has to be self-discipline here. Uh, I don't think that it's probably healthy for the press and the television uh, uh, producers uh, to feel that they have an absolutely free hand. And perhaps the political man now and then, uh, without perhaps the heat I displayed in 1962, if he thinks that he's being put upon, he should say so. And he has the right to answer without it being construed as an attack on freedom of the press. That's right. It, if it could be done rationally. Uh, let, let me say this, that I'm convinced that the great majority of the commentators and the columnists and the reporters do have a high sense of duty in this respect. You wouldn't be in the business otherwise. I mean, they're not... Uh, after all, you're not uh, <coughs> paid excessively, as you well know. Uh, you, go into, you go into your profession just as political men go into their professions. It's, uh, uh, you don't go in for the money. Uh, you go in because uh, you have a high uh, idealism. Uh, I know that the press men are considered to be cynical, but basically I know that deep down they're idealistic. Now, as idealists, uh, they want to be fair. Uh, most of them tend to be more toward the liberal side. I think we would have to admit that. Uh, that's because of the background from which they come. But even they, uh, those who come from the liberal side, those who come from the conservative side, recognize this responsibility to attempt to be fair. Why are there so few conservative journalists? I think it's because of the, the educational background. Uh, who are the men that go into the journalism school? Uh, who are the men, for example, who uh, major in those subjects which eventually bring them into communications? Uh, generally, you will find that uh, they are the men who are more motivated toward the liberal side than the conservative side. Let's put it this way. Generally speaking, and I think we would qualify you this way, and we've known each other a number of years. Generally speaking, uh, the men in communications are what Woodrow Wilson called men of thought, whereas the men in business are men, in, men of action. Now, the men of thought, uh, the people who go into teaching, the people who go into journalism, the people who go into television and radio, tend to be men who are quite suspicious of the men of action, the businessman, the man who's out there making money. He's a selfish so-and-so. Uh, he's the fellow that, for example, determines the budget for this show. Uh, he's the one, or the advertiser, that uh, perhaps brings pressure to bear when he shouldn't very subtly upon the content of a news program. Uh, and all of this sort of thing raises the hackles on their backs. Uh, so generally speaking, I think uh, even subconsciously, uh, the men of thought in the great profession of which you are a member uh, tend to react against the men of action in, in what you call the military-industrial complex. Uh -huh. I'd stand on my record through the years. Uh, uh, I've always campaigned on the issues. I've never campaigned personally uh, on, in any of these campaigns, and uh, I expect to do it this time, too. For example, if I become a candidate, my campaign will be entirely on the basis of uh, what we can do to get the country new leadership. Uh, I'm not interested in the personal weaknesses or strengths of the other potential Republicans. Uh, I'm not going to be engaged in debate with them about uh, statements or misstatements that they may have made in the past or that I may have made. Uh, I'm not going to be interested in President Johnson's accent and his style and all these other things, but what I will be interested in is how can the United States get more effective leadership at a critical period in our history when the United States could not have more problems every place in the world than we have today. There's never been a time when we were in more trouble in more places in the world, clearly apart from Vietnam than we are today. There's never been a time when the American people had less confidence in their government, less respect for their government than they have today. These are the great issues that I think we should talk about. Do you think, however, that it's, it's going to be possible for the presidential uh, nominee to appeal for urban votes on the basis of the Republican record in Congress? Do you think the Republicans in the present Congress have been responsive to the needs of city dwellers? 
in terms of how the Republican record is being appraised at this moment, the answer to your question would be no. But that will change. It will change because uh, the administration's record with regard to the cities is abysmally poor. Uh, and this country does not simply want to beef up a lot of programs that have failed. Uh, let's, let's take this whole welfare program. Uh, when we talk about the fact that we've got to have billions more for welfare, what we're doing there simply are perpetuating uh, some of the very problems of the past. And what we need are entirely new approaches, new approaches to the problems of the cities, new appro approaches to the problems uh, of the minority groups. The Republicans, up to this point, have appeared to be in the negative position of being against what the administration was doing. That isn't enough. Uh, but the Republicans also, you will note, uh, in the House particularly, and some in the Senate, have had a program for housing and a program for jobs and a program for education for our big cities, which will correct what I think are many of the weaknesses in the present administration and do something about these programs rather than simply saying something about them, which will use money effectively rather than wasting it. Now, I think we'll do pretty well in the big cities based on the entire record, not simply on what it appears to be right now. Uh -huh. On Vietnam, you predicted in an interview a year ago that Mr. Johnson would try desperately, well, you didn't use that word, to settle the war. You said he would not tolerate having this war go on until 1968. A lot of what you said about his intensification has happened. Do you still think there's a possibility he'll end the thing by the time of the election? I would hope so. Uh, I would hope, too, that the Republicans as a party, I'm not referring now to individual dissent, which uh, we all must respect, but that the Republicans at a party uh, would make it quite clear that uh, while we disagree with the conduct of the war, while we believe that if President Johnson had taken our advice over a period of time, the war uh, could have been substantially shortened and we could see the end in sight at this point, that nevertheless, uh, we, for the balance of his term, uh, are going to support the commitment in Vietnam so that the enemy will not be encouraged to hang on with the idea that after the election, uh, he's going to get a concessions, appeasement from the Republicans. Now, uh, I don't mean by that that the Republican position should not be different. It should be quite different in terms of the conduct of the war because I believe this war has, been, has gone on much longer than it needed to. I believe we've never had so much military and economic and diplomatic power used so ineffectively. Uh, I believe we failed to mobilize the forces in South Vietnam effectively. So that, they can, so that they can take over uh, the responsibility of handling these guerrilla activities at an earlier time than will presently be the case. We could give chapter and verse on all that. But on the other hand, looking at President Johnson and his position, I would hope that he, uh, with the support that he's had from the Republicans for the commitment, support which was denied from his own party, would be able to end the war before 1968. I would hope this would be the case. But Mr. Nixon, if the war has split the Democratic Party, isn't any kind of a negotiated settlement going to split your party in the, uh, in the sense that some people are going to accept it and some people are not? If a negotiated settlement is one that is not interpreted as a reward for aggression... Well, that's the point. If a uh, there will be no split in the Republican Party and should be none in the country. Uh, and I have no reason to believe that President Johnson would agree to any negotiated settlement which would be a reward for aggression. But when you say I that, read his statements and I, I, I take them at face value. But doesn't that, isn't, doesn't that mean you, you demand unconditional surrender of the communists in Vietnam? Because oh, no, when you say they all. should not be rewarded, don't no. you exclude give and take, exclude negotiation? Not at all. Unconditional surrender means the surrender of North Vietnam. Uh, this, this, our object in this war is not to defeat North Vietnam. Our object is not to conquer it. I oppose invasion of North Vietnam, mm. I oppose nuclear weapons, I oppose uh, the declaration of war against North Vietnam. Our goal is solely, in a very different sense, the same as we had in Korea. And that is North Vietnam should be left alone right. and South Vietnam should be left alone. What about a reward for the Viet Cong? Do you, do you say that they should have no, no uh, reward for their years of guerrilla warfare against the The same Saturn? thing. The Viet Cong, from everything that I've been able to read, uh, are simply a front, and that's they are, the National Liberation Front. They're a front for the North Vietnamese. Uh, the Viet Cong have some indigenous personnel, but they are completely controlled, completely staffed by North Vietnam. Uh, and once North Vietnam uh, takes its hands off South Vietnam, the South Vietnamese will be able to handle the Viet Cong. Uh, as far as uh, any settlement 
which would in effect take the Viet Cong as a unit and bring them into the government, that would be a reward for aggression. Whoa. As far as any settlement which would allow members of the Viet Cong as individuals, rather than as agents of North Vietnam, uh, to participate in the political life of South Vietnam, uh, no one would have any objection to that. But you're expecting uh, the Viet Cong to settle for very little in, the, in terms of reward for their guerrilla warfare over this <clears throat> decade. My, my attitude is pretty much the same as uh, I suppose it would have been in, in uh, the early years of World War II. We could have settled very, very easily with Hitler had we given him half of France. Uh, I mean, after all, he had it all, so why not give him half? Uh, so as far as North Vietnam is concerned, we could settle by giving them half of South Vietnam, maybe just the parts that are not as heavily populated. My answer is that the principle that we're fighting for there is far bigger than this fight between North and South Vietnam. It involves whether or not naked aggression is to be rewarded. And it is naked aggression. It's an attempt on the part of North Vietnam, supported by Communist China and the Soviet Union, to export revolution to export it and support it. Now, if it succeeds there, it will be tried elsewhere. If it does not succeed there, it may still be tried elsewhere, but the likelihood is reduced. And by reducing that likelihood, we increase the chances for peace. This is what is involved. Uh, it's very difficult for us to see. I think Churchill said it very well uh, when he was a voice in the wilderness at the time of Munich, and you remember, uh, he was criticized by all the great newspapers. The New York Times had an editorial criticizing those who did not accept the Munich settlement and, uh, at the time. And uh, I must admit, most Americans felt this was peace in our time. But Churchill said those who would uh, believe that you gain security by throwing a small state to the wolves are suffering a fatal delusion. And I think that's what is involved in this Vietnamese war. And I think in terms of the broad general principle, no Republican uh, would accept the proposition there should be a reward for aggression. Now, we might disagree on the definition, oh, what but, was the reward, reward? but the reward for aggression, in my view, is the principle that we must constantly keep in front of us. As far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, I think the peace should be very generous. Uh, I believe that as far as North Vietnam is concerned, we should be willing to help them rebuild their shattered in industries uh, and other installations that have been destroyed by our bombing forces. Uh, I believe as far as the Viet Cong is concerned, we should be very generous insofar as allowing them individually uh, to participate in the life of South Vietnam. Uh, I, I believe that the United States, just as soon as the South Vietnamese have the military and economic and political capability to handle their own affairs, of course should withdraw from South Vietnam. Uh, all of these things are subject to negotiation. But in terms of a negotiation uh, which would provide for the North Vietnamese, for the Viet Cong, and for those who are the leaders in Peking and Moscow, provide for them the propaganda claim that they had won, won something by aggression that they could not have won without the aggression. This would be a great disaster for the cause of peace. That's what is involved. I'm, I think we must remember this war is not just about Vietnam. If it were, it wouldn't be worth the cost, much as we're interested in what happens to people anyplace. This war is about us. It's about peace in the Pacific. Uh, it is about this whole concept of whether the new type of aggression, exporting and supporting a revolution, is to succeed. We talked earlier about Korea. The Korean War was a difficult war also. But as you may remember, I supported our going into Korea. I disagreed with the way it was conducted, but I supported it. And I believe that Korea served a very useful purpose. And the best indication of that is that since Korea, there has been no attempt by a major power to effect conquest by marching across a border. Now in Vietnam, we have the other side of the coin, conquest by going under a border. Therefore, this is the time, it seems to me, to show that lesson very effectively to those who try it.